automatic textile factories. Um, they're a big jump in human standards of living, um, simply because before you have machines, making clothes is an important and extraordinarily labor-intensive um, process. And you can see signs of this if you look back in our collective literary record. Um, you know, I should have made um, an eye clicker question about this. Um, but like, say, if you go and if you read um, you know, the Odyssey, um, Odysseus, king of Ithaca, trying to get back home from the Trojan War, um, has a very difficult time having angered a bunch of gods along the way who are kind of vindictive sons of a bitch, um, sons of bitches, and are trying very hard to make his life difficult. Um, on his way back, he runs into an incredible number of women of one form or another. Um, some of them are enchantresses who turn his sailors into pigs. Um, one of them is a young princess who is playing by the side of the beach um, with her friends when he gets washed up. Um, what are the rest of them all doing um, when he meets them? Um, what one activity are they doing? Um, whether they're a maid in his household when he returns to Ithaca in disguise, or whether they are Helen, Queen of Sparta herself. Um, anyone want to guess what they're doing? I'm um, close. They're weaving. Right? Um, Helen of Troy, right? the daughter of Zeus and Leda, supposedly the most beautiful woman in classical Greece, um, the reason for the whole Trojan War. After the war, after her husband Menelaus um, recaptures her from Paris the Trojan, kind of not to her liking, and takes her back to Sparta, where she's queen of Sparta again, um, what's she doing when people show up? Um, you know, she's not eating grapes or lounging around or listening to poetry. She's kind of sitting there at the loom, um, kind of throwing the warp and the weft across each other um, to make cloth. Um, from 1800 to 1870, um, you get steam engines, you get automated textile, textile machinery, and you get railroads. Um, and that's the overwhelming bulk of improvements in output per capita between 1800 and 1870, the application of those three technologies. It's only after 1870 that you get the general burst of invention and innovation in the economy as a whole rather than a couple of leading sectors. Um, that's why sometimes I'll get confused during this course and sometimes I'll say modern economic growth begins in 1800 and sometimes I'll say modern economic growth begins in 1870 uh, because I'm kind of ambivalent about whether to count the railroad and textile revolutions of 1800 to 1870 as the last gasp of medieval technological progress or the first gasp of modern. Um, so what does our magic equation tell us about this 20-fold increase in output per capita in the United States over the past two centuries? Um, you have GDP per capita on the leading edge <coughs> up by a factor of 20 in the United States. You end up by a factor of 10 in Great Britain in the United Kingdom since 1800. Over that period, you also have population growth N in the United States down from 3% to 1% per year. And a country that has a slower rate of population growth um, should be a richer country. Um, after all, this N is here in the denominator. That means that if your population growth rate is lower, then this term inside these parentheses will be higher. Um, the capital intensity of your economy will be greater. <coughs> um, and a higher capital intensity raised to this particular power is going to mean a more prosperous economy. Um, why is it that an economy with a lower population growth rate is in general going to be a more prosperous one? Um, well, if you're saving and investing the same amount, and if your capital stock is wearing out at the same amount, then if your population growth rate is lower, um, more of the machines you make to add to your capital stock um, can go to help existing workers increase the machinery at their disposal, can make their production process more capital intensive, and thus make what they produce over the course of their workday um, more productive, um, greater and larger. If the population growth rate is higher, <coughs> well, then your labor force is growing rapidly, so a whole bunch of your savings and investment has to go to providing your new workers with the same amount and kinds of machines that your old worker already had. That a faster population growth rate economy has more investment diverted to simply spreading to simply giving the new workers the same capital stock the old workers were used to working with, rather than adding to the capital that each worker can use um, to be more productive. That's why an economy with a lower population growth rate is probably going to be more productive. <coughs> Similarly, um, an economy with a higher savings rate is going to be more productive as well, also through this capital intensity channel. Um, save and invest more, and your average worker will have more machines and better buildings in which to work, and will become more productive. Um, why does the savings investment share increase over the past two centuries? Some of it is because of better financial markets that make it a lot easier to save. Um, nowadays, you can save and put your money off in a bank or in Wall Street or whatever, and if you're properly diversified, and if you're not unlucky, and if you don't invest with Bernie Madoff, um, or somebody else of that ilk, your money will still be there um, for you to get it out when you come back. Um, in fact, it'll hopefully be amplified. Um, by contrast, back in 1800, um, you invest. Um, God knows if you're ever going to get your money back, or if they're just going to steal it, or falsely report the ship was lost, um, when in fact it arrived home perfectly well. Better financial markets, better control, better financial regulation uh, mean that um, the, your likelihood of getting something out of your personal savings is going to be higher, and that's going to be push up um, your savings rate. Um, even if the people you're dealing with aren't quite so straightforward or honest with their dealings. Um, how, many people, how many people have seen The Social Network? Um, Okay. Uh, not quite part of our common culture. Um, you know, a movie worth seeing um, makes Harvard undergraduate life out to be a much more dissolute place uh, than it actually is, uh, and also makes Harvard's climate um, out to be much better than it actually is. There are no scenes of absolute total slush and rain. Um, generally, it's just people are wearing attractive parkas in the winter, which doesn't quite fit. Um, you know, one of the characters in there um, thinks he has a one-quarter share of Facebook and winds up after a bunch of financial manipulations with a one-fiftieth share of ownership of Facebook, um, Eduardo. Um, but thanks to the American legal system, um, Eduardo now has a billion dollars. Um, which is a very nice return for investing the first thousand dollars in Facebook, uh, and which shows that even if you don't think your partners have treated you right, the fact that there's an effective court system means that you can lend, a, you can invest a thousand dollars in your roommate's harebrained internet venture, and if it turns out to be profitable beyond anyone's wildest dreams, you can earn a very high return on it. The second reason that savings rates are higher is because rich economies are very good at making machines, which means that the same savings effort you, in, you make produces a much larger in investment outcome um, when the things you can make are various complicated, fancy pieces of electronic equipment, um, rather than things made out of wood that you hope won't sink. Um, that too has to do with the increase in the savings investment share. Um, how much of this growth that we've seen over the past 200 years can these two factors account for? Um, well, if you want to assume a diminishing returns parameter of a half, um, then a doubling of savings investment rates, that that would double you know, your output per capita. That if your diminishing returns factor in alpha is a half, um, 
then you get a half divided by a half up here in the exponent, so that's just a one. So then your output per worker is going to be proportional to your capital intensity, and your capital intensity is going to be proportional to your savings investment share. So if you double the share of the economy that's savings, you're going to double output per worker as well. Um, we did that. That's one of the doublets that's brought the United States from where it was in 1800 to 20 times its current level today. Yeah? Uh, it can't be more than one, right? Um, or at least unless it could be more than one, but that's a science fiction scenario called the singularity or something, um, in which you add to the capital stock and that produces more, in which a one percentage point increase in the capital stock generates a more than one percent increase um, in output. Um, if Chad Jones, who we lost to Stanford, um, I think four years ago, yeah, it was really quite sad, right? That Chad was comparing his Berkeley offer and his Stanford offer, and he computed that he could pay for someone to drive him um, from Berkeley to Stanford and back, um, and sit in the back of the limousine surfing the internet and writing his papers for a third of the salary differential uh, between Stanford and Berkeley. Um, and the only thing on the other side was that his office view at Stanford is really lousy. Uh, while at Berkeley, he had a sixth floor office in Evans Hall, one of those looking straight west at the Golden Gate, and he's looking at the Golden Gate from 100 feet above the Berkeley campus. And there's nothing that, um, you know, we had a plan to set up a webcam um, showing the view from his office and broadcast it and tell him to come look at it and hope he'd come back. It hasn't worked. It never worked. Um, the chat were here, we'd talk a bunch about those kinds of situations in which the capital share of the economy, in which there really are no diminishing returns. Uh, Paul Romer at Stanford also likes to talk about such models. I don't think they're right. I think alpha is going to be less than one. Um, but it's certainly not the case that my productivity or any of our productivity, you know, by a second laptop, uh, my productivity doesn't double. Um, it is certainly true that I seem to want to have seven microprocessors surrounding me when I lecture, uh, but that appears to be it. Um, and an alpha of one or higher would seem to indicate that you know, um, that there never is any reduction um, in how productive things are. That people are kind of a zero in the production function. It's just things that make things and not people. And that may be true someday, in which we're all replaced by robots, but not now. Um, now people are still important. Um, you know. So doubling from the, fall, the doubling of savings investment rates. Um, the fall in population growth rates from 3% to 1% per year in the United States. You feed that um, back into our equation with an efficiency growth rate of labor of the 2% per year that we've seen over the past century and a half, and a 3 or 4% per year depreciation rate, um, shrinking n from 3% down to 1%, that's going to diminish the denominator by enough to boost capital intensity by enough um, to maybe boost output per capita by an extra third, uh, because we're a low population growth economy now rather than a high population growth economy now. And you multiply these things through things together, and maybe you can account for a tripling of output per capita since 1800, but that still leaves a factor of 7 um, for the United States. So the conclusion is that the United States now were richer than our counterparts were in 1800. Um, that of that, we're about three times richer than our counterparts were back in 1800 because we have more resources per worker to apply because we have slower population growth and a higher investment share. But then there's another factor of seven because the efficiency of our labor is higher because we have access to more and better technologies and more and better forms of productive organization than we had back in 1800. Um, so the efficiency of labor is the place to get most of the story. Um, we have better educated workers. We have better technologies. Um, and here I kind of have to drop um, the subject, because if you want to know what makes for better technologies, you really should apply to Shankar Shastri and his engineering school. Um, we have better organizations, uh, but if you really want to know what makes for better organizations, we should probably go up to Haas and talk to Rich Lyons, Rich Lyons' people and the Haas professors about business organization. Um, the, the economists have to take a broader view and say, what happened, can we make happen, can governments do to speed this progress, which is primarily technological and secondarily um, organizational progress. Um, and, you know, that's um, a good place to stop. Um, and let me say, next time I'll pick up with looking not at why are we so much richer than we were back in 1800 than our counterparts were back in 1800. But how can we understand something like the United States now being so rich? Um, and Haiti, right? Um, Haiti that back in 1800 was about as rich as the United States was back in 1800. Um, Haiti is now so very, very poor.